Perfect. Well, thank you, and sorry for the delay, everybody. And uh, Kristen, thank you for the invitation to uh, share with everybody today. Um, I'm again Ron Jones, the Director of Food and Nutrition Spartanburg School District 6. And if you go ahead and advance that slide. Um, Kristen, let me know that um, I, I should take a few minutes to brag about some of the projects <laughs> that we're working on here in Spartanburg 6. So uh, thank you for that opportunity and we'll share with you here. Um, Spartanburg 6 is blessed. Um, we have uh, 48 acres of organic, certified organic farmland here, which is uh, in a trust, a land trust in Spartanburg School District 6. Um, we are GAP certified um, and again, organically certified. Uh, what you're seeing in that photograph there is uh, the end of the winter crop. There's purple cabbage and red cabbage and collard greens and broccoli out there in that field. And uh, go ahead and advance the slide. Um, we also have uh, hydroponic greenhouses uh, here, uh, one at the dormant freshman campus, uh, one at the farm, and a third one being built. Uh, on the right-hand side, um, you see uh, lettuces being grown in a uh, hydroponic system. Those lettuces work their way into our school cafeterias for salads and sandwiches, whatnot. Uh, on the left-hand side uh, is the greenhouse that's out at the farm. Uh, what you're showing there is uh, tomatoes. We grow tomatoes, cucumbers, and, uh, and lunchbox peppers year-round in that greenhouse with inc incredible yields. The next uh, slide. Um, the crops that we, main crops that we have here, we have 500 blueberry bushes that are coming in right now. Um, we've got 5,000 Roma tomato plants in the field. Uh, we have cherry tomatoes in the greenhouse. Uh, we have several rows of cucumbers and a lot of the acreage is planted. Um, sweet potatoes will go in soon. Um, summer squash, cantaloupe, uh, summer squash, zucchini is, is being harvested as we speak, um, and melons are on their way. Uh, we have four beehives out there, so honey is coming. We also have other crops as we um, see needed and as we're as we're experimenting. The photograph that you hear that you see here is one of the smaller greenhouses where all of the seeding and uh, seedlings are are taken care of, um, and that was uh, my managers of cafeterias out there um, this spring as we were introducing them to the, the tools that we have and how we're going to bring organic food to children in Spartanburg 6. Next slide. Uh, this came in from the field yesterday. Um, zucchini on the left, yellow squash, and some beautiful, beautiful slicing tomatoes. Um, they actually redder than they look, but um, that's my fault. Um, what we do this time of year is um, the tomatoes and squash that you see will be used in summer feeding operations. Of course, the sheer volume that we have will be greater than our need. So we have a processing center where we'll cut and flash freeze the squash uh, in 10 pound bags or 40 pound boxes. It'll be scoopable. When it comes out, we have recipes to season and roast it and to go on our lines daily throughout the year. Um, all of our tomato products get sent to the processing center. If they can't be readily used freshly, um, we'll turn them into organic tomato sauce and pizza sauce to be used throughout the school year. Um, and that's just some of the things that we do at the processing center. Next slide. All right, so that was our farm to school initiative. And we're here to talk about some menu engineering. Um, so uh, Deming said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. And with that, bring us to the next slide. Thank you. What should you learn today? What will we learn? We're going to learn about menu engineering. We're going to use how we're going to determine how menu engineering uses data to drive participation and profitability. We're going to learn what is contribution to margin and why it's important. And uh, what do I need to know about beginning menu engineering? Next slide. So menu engineering is an interdisciplinary field of study devoted to the deliberate and strategic construction of menus. Um, I underline strategic because we need to have a strategy in how we're going to bring products to children that they want to eat, that are going to drive participation, but also is going to be able to give us the funds that we need to pay our bills and put some money away for better food for kids and better training for kids. 
um, without a deliberate intent, uh, a, a deliberate a plan, um, often we get to the end of the year and scratch our head and, and wonder why we were in the red um, and we didn't uh, make any money um, when the opportunity was probably there. Um, so we need to be strategic in the way that we're planning our menus. Next slide. So simply stated, menu engineering is using data to maximize profit on all transactions. Menu engineering directs you to menu items that your students like that maximize your profit. And lastly, it, we need to come to the terms here in school nutrition that profit is not a dirty word. In some of my last positions, you know, I was told not to discuss profit because um, we were education and that, um, you know, we were here to educate children uh, in school food service. We're running a business and we need to be able to talk about profit freely and see how we're going to get there again so that we can reinvest those funds for better food for kids. Um, if we don't have that investment money, um, we're not going to be able to drive the quality program that we want. So profit is very important. Next slide. Okay, so menu engineering can be used for basically all items on your menu. You can use it for your lunch items. You can use it for your breakfast items. You can use it for your a la carte. And in your a la carte section, you can even break it down to subgroups. One of the places that I am uh, not um, seeing a huge upside of it would be in your after school snack program. It could be helpful, but um, these other areas would be much um, much better serve for the time and energy that you're going to take doing your menu engineering. Next slide. Okay, menu engineering um, is a concept that started with a consulting group in Boston in the 1970s. And um, before that, uh, a lot of us in business, and yes, I've been in the business that long, um, uh, were told that if we ran a certain percentage of food cost, that we would be okay. If we kept our food cost at X percent, and we kept our labor cost at X percent, that um, we would still be able to make money. But that was the thought. Well, after the 70s, the Boston uh, Consulting Group started to reassess um, um, how you menued and how you ran your food cost with the concept of basically you should take what the market will bear. You should take what's there for you to take, but you need to understand what's there to take. So the process uh, can be a little bit detailed. There's a lot of work on the front, but the work on the front end pays off. First time that I did menu engineering for a school district, I worked for the largest school district in the state of South Carolina. Uh, I was going through my Lane Six Sigma training and I chose a menu engineering project on the a la carte items in the district um, as my project for my Lean Six Sigma. Um, and literally brought have brought millions of dollars in revenue back to that district uh, with the process of menu, menu engineering. So the process is this. The first thing you have to do is you have to determine the cost of everything that you sell, whether it's the cost of a breakfast, whether it's the cost of a lunch, your after school snack, or all those individual items that you're selling on an a la carte basis. One way you can do that is manually and sit down with a spreadsheet or pen and paper and you can get your invoices and and determine what the cost of those menu items are some of you are blessed enough to have pos systems back of the house systems which um, uh, will give you that information and others of you are blessed to use healthy bro and healthy bro provides that information and um, spartanburg six we're getting on the healthy pro bandwagon and we'll be using it uh, to do that work for us um, the second thing that you'll have to do is determine the menu price or the revenue um, that's going to be associated with those costs. So if you're doing a reimbursable meal, it's the reimbursement rate in any local funds or it's your menu pricing. The next thing you need to do is determine how popular the thing that you're tracking is. And you can do that through looking at your production records, looking at your point of sale in your back of the house or using velocity reports um, from your vendors. Um, also, uh, I left, left it on here. You could use a report that I'm going to show you in Healthy Pro. Um, in your a la carte items, a lot of velocity reporting through the uh, through your vendor 
is probably the way to go. Um, a lot of our POS systems aren't tracking menu items to the point where you can really see the movement. For instance, if you're charging a dollar for, for a beverage and you're charging a dollar for a bag of baked chips, you might just have a dollar entry key. It's not tracking the sales with the lever, level of granularity that you need to show you uh, the detail. So in that case, I would go back to my vendor and say, how many cases of bottled water did I use? How many cases of chocolate chip cookies did I use? How many cases of, of baked lace did I use? Um, so you can use your velocity reports. After you get the cost of your menu items and you uh, determine your revenue and you determine the popularity, then you would enter this information into a spreadsheet, a menu engineering spreadsheet, and you would take action based on what you see in that spreadsheet and then continue to re repeat the process. Next slide, please. So I have some rules with menu engineering and the first rule is the, is the important rule, it's follow the data. When the data tells you a story, you have to listen to it and you have to pay attention. The next thing is that you really have to take the emotion out of the equation. So in my experience in that last large district, one of the very first things that we found out was um, that bottled water, uh, we were seeing some real opportunities in bottled water. Uh, an eight ounce bottle of water was costing us substantially more than a 16.9 ounce bottle but we were charging 25 cents less per bottle. So the smart thing to do there is to stop small, selling the small bottle, sell the large bottle and take the extra revenue. And when we made that recommendation, cafeteria managers balked and said, oh, my babies love those little bottles. They love those little bottles. And that's true, they did, okay? But the advice was to take out the little bottles, give them the larger bottles. The value perception would be there but more importantly, there was more money left to pay the bills after the sale. Um, we were selling fruit by the foot, the fruit leather product. We were also selling Welch's fruit shoes, little gummies. The fruit by the foot, we were making 10 cents on every sale. The Welch's gummies, we were making 35 cents on every sale. So the very simple solution is there, stop selling fruit by the foot and assume that the children who were buying that would switch to the Welch's gummies. And they did. And as they did, our profitability skyrocketed. Be sure to consider your USDA foods in the process. And remember that the process is ongoing. You continue to monitor, you continue to see what's popular and what's not, what food cost is appropriate and what isn't. Next slide, please. Some basic review here. One of the first things we wanna track is food cost percentage. And again, your basic formula would be the cost of the food divided by your menu price would give you your food cost percentage. So a couple of quick tables there. If you're 46 cents for a bottle of water and you charge the dollars 46%. Next slide. How to find your food costs. We covered this quickly. Use Healthy Pro, your back of the house system, or do the math. Next slide. How to determine your menu prices. Again, we covered this one. It would be your reimbursement or your reimbursement plus local funds or whatever you're charging for the items that you're selling. Next slide. Next key topic, it's very, very important to understand is the contribution to margin. And that is the item that you're selling, how much it contributes to the profit how much it continues to the, contributes to the bottom line after the sale. We'll be provided a chart. And if you sold a hamburger dinner at $8.95 and your cost was $2.95, it would contribute to $6 in margin. A chicken biscuit, if you had a menu price of $2.95, your cost was $1.50, your contribution to margin would be $1.45. Okay, next slide. Paying attention to contribution to margin. Um, if you take a look at, and I brought these um, seafood um, examples to you because I grew up in the seafood industry in, in New Hampshire and family business. And these were examples from the menus that we used. We figured this out early in my restaurant existence and in my business existence um, that we were trained, my father was a banker and I was in the restaurant business with him. 
And we were trained back then that we should be running a 28 to 32 percent food cost because we're a seasonal operation. And then we were told that anything over a 32 percent food cost, we shouldn't consider selling because we weren't going to make any money. But all of a sudden, common sense prevailed. And we realized that we were selling twin lobster dinner for twenty three ninety five, and our food cost was 12, 12 bucks. So we basically had a 50 percent food cost there. And all the bankers and the business people were telling us, don't go above 32%. We were making 50%. But if you look, we were taking almost $12 to the bank. Okay, so our food cost was 50%. And we were told that was wrong. However, we were missing the opportunity to put a big chunk of money in the bank. And if we um, didn't offer that menu item and the people ordered a clam dinner, you would see it was a 35% food cost, which is where we should be but we were only putting $8.42 in the bank, okay? And the lobster roll at 33%, we'd be putting $9 and change in the bank. So uh, pre precautionary tail food cost uh, percentage is a very, very important number. We need to monitor it, we need to pay attention to it, but we also need to consider how much profit, how much contribution to margin the products that we sell are gonna put into our bank account. Next slide. So consider this, um, this was the situation in the last uh, district that I worked in, a large one that I did this project in, we were buying beef jerky at $1.13 a bag and we put it on the menu for $2. The food cost percentage on that is 56.5%, okay? For conventional wisdom would say you don't do that, that you don't menu something out of 57% food cost. But if you look, every time we did it, we put 87 cents in the bank. We were putting more money in the bank selling a bag of beef jerky than we were by selling a reimbursable meal. Um, so um, again, contribution to margin is very, very important as you're, as you're planning your business. Next slide. How it works in menu engineering, we're going to take the data that we uh, had looked at, that we had told you about, um, the cost of your products, the popularity, uh, your menu price, we're going to put it into a spreadsheet and it's going to spit out a report for us and it's going to tell us if our items are stars, if they're dogs, if they're puzzles, or if they're plow horses. And a star is in the upper right hand section of the metrics. If you follow the bottom line of the metric, it's profitability. Starting on the left, it's low and on the right, it's high. The further to the right you go, the better the profitability is. The, on the axis going up, you'll see that it's popularity. Low is in the left corner and high is in the uh, upper left corner. So a star is high right, okay? And that's telling us it's high profit and it's highly possible, highly popular. That's what we want our menu to look like. We want as many stars on our menu as we can. But remember, the process is ongoing. So you're always going to have something that's not stars. Um, the goal is to try to keep as many as you can. A dog is the opposite. Again, it's a low profitability and it's a low popularity. We always say shoot the dogs. Okay, if the dog, if you got something that's low profitable and it's low popular, we don't need to be messing around with it. Then you have something that's a puzzle. Because if you look at it, you make a lot of money doing it, but it's not very popular. And a plow horse is highly popular, but it has a low process, low profit. Next slide. So what do we do? You run the analysis, you keep the stars, you eliminate the dogs, you analyze the plow horse. Again, the plow horse is highly popular, but it's low profitable. So what do you do? Can you find a way to reduce the cost? Can you utilize your USDA? Can you utilize your DOD? What can you do to pull that cost down to take a highly popular menu item more profitable and push it towards the star category? And to strategize, uh, excuse me, um, the puzzles, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Uh, if you have a puzzle, which again, which is highly popular, but it's a low, uh, highly profitable, but low popularity, you would need to strategize to see how you could fix that through maybe menu mix or placement or sampling or marketing. What is it that you're going to do to change that scenario? Next slide. Um, in the last district where we um, 
and some other districts that I worked with in the state here. We had some examples of uh, menu engineering excesses, and these are primarily in our a la carte business. Um, we're selling ice cream products. The vendor was bringing in two, two price points, 35 cents and 55 cents, but the district was charging a dollar for all ice cream. So we had a decision to make. Are we going to take the 35 cent ice creams and move them to $1.25? Or are we going to stop selling the 35, excuse me, stop serving the 55 cent ice creams and charge a dollar for all 35 cents, uh, all products that we paid 35 cents? So the decision was made there that anything that cost 50 cents, we weren't going to bring into the ice cream products anymore. We were only going to bring in the 35 cent items. Um, ice cream sales didn't dip, sales were consistent. So therefore, we picked up an extra 20 cents on every ice cream that we sold from October till May that year. Um, and the numbers were staggering. Um, beverage sales um, and marketing, we were using a very popular sparkling juice product. Um, and it was the most popular beverage that we were using. But what we found was not only was it the most popular beverage that we were using, it was also the most expensive beverage that we were buying or one of the most expensive beverages that we were buying. So we just pulled it. Okay. And the beverage sales didn't go down. The beverage sales sales stayed stable. Um, so therefore our revenue went up. We were using a double chocolate chuck cookie. It was costing us 30 cent, 30% more than all other cookies on our menu. And once again, it was the most popular item. So we took it away. Now bear in mind, all the other cookies that we were doing were fabulous products. Okay, we were we were proud of the products that we were serving. Um, the kids missed it for a couple of days, and then business went on. Cookie sales didn't drop, and our um, revenue was uh, rewarded for it. Um, looking at chips and snacks, um, we realized that we had two different packages of baked chips out there. One of them was a 0.87 uh, ounce bag, and one of them was a one ounce bag. You put them on the counter side by side, they looked identical. And in selling the larger bag, we were making less money. So we went ahead and took away the larger bag and standardized chip sales throughout the district. Water sales, the eight ounce bottle was, uh, I've already mentioned it, a lot more expensive than the 16.9, so we did away with it. All of those things led to huge amounts of revenue in the a la carte program. Next slide. So how um, do we handle this with Healthy Pro? Um, <clears throat> Healthy Pro dashboard is extremely helpful in driving our business. And when you sign in and you look at the dashboard and you look at the upper right quadrant where you have your average food cost, you're gonna be able to look at the impacts of your menu engineering um, based on your average food cost. Um, next slide. So in Healthy Pro, um, the work is done for you. Um, you're not have going to have to go back and redetermine the profitability, the popularity, the food cost percentage or the food cost. All of the data is there. <clears throat> and Healthy Pro pops this up for you. So the menu engineering is done. And if you look at the example here, this is an example Kristen sent to me. This is no particular district. Um, you'll see that they had an Asian chicken salad. They served 11. Um, the food cost on it was 84 cents and it had, was a low profit and it was a, and it was not popular. So it's considered a dog. So we would keep our eye on that. And if that trend maintained, that's not a menu item that we would use. Um, go down, well, there's got some breakfast items in here. So the first thing you would do is look for those, those stars or those rock stars and build them up, get rid of the dogs and start to change the way people are buying their foods. Uh, next slide. Oh, can you go back one? I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, so once again, looking at this menu um, optimization report, um, our earlier notes were that we were going to eliminate dogs, analyze the plow horses to reduce cost and strategize on how we're gonna use the puzzles. So in Healthy Pro, the data is here. And what we're recommending is that you use this section of Healthy Pro and start to 
determine which of your menu items are the ones that are highly popular with the kids so that they're getting the ones that they want and also the ones that are returning the most money back to you. This should be done in your breakfast menu, should be done in your lunch menu, and it should be done often. I don't, I haven't used Healthy Pro enough now to understand whether or not we can use this section for our, our La Carte sales. Um, if you can, Kristen, can you help me with that? Absolutely, let me make sure that I'm, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect, just making sure I was on mute. Yeah, you can certainly do this on your a la carte. What this does is it, it it, this is a restaurant industry um, equation and basically any foods that are on any menu, whether it's a breakfast, lunch or a la carte, it's going to compare up against the others and show as long as you're keeping your production records right in the system to show what was prepared and what was actually served, um, it will run this equation against anything in any menu, whether it's a la carte or not. Thank you. Um, a lot of us may not be putting um, a la carte sales into our production records, depending on what state we're in. Um, so if it's not there, um, there's some really good free menu engineering spreadsheets available online. If you go into your search engine, put in menu engineering spreadsheets, several of, uh, of them will pop up that are free for download. And you would just have to read the instructions and pop in the data. Um, but you would have to go get that data before you pop it in. The beautiful thing here about Healthy Pro is this information is here. Um, it's at our fingertips. And here in Spartanburg 6, we will be using this to keep pushing the most popular menu items forward, running those menu items more uh, repetitively, um, marketing them heavier, and uh, eliminating the ones that aren't making money for us and continue to drive it and drive it and drive it so that our customers are happy and we're putting as much as we can to the bottom line. And I am free for questions if I've missed anything or anybody has any comments or questions, I'd be happy to address them. All right, we had one question. I think it was more about the sharing on the, um, on the PowerPoint, which it looks like it was. We've got several people in here. Does anybody have any questions for Ron about the menu engineering piece of it? I know it can get kind of scientific and very numbery, but um, this is a great opportunity to really begin to understand your menu. And if you have any questions, he's got this down to a science and he absolutely can give great tips and tricks. All right, Ron, so here's my question for you. I've got a couple that I have been writing down as we go along. So uh, my question for you is, if you are um, in a COVID situation, particularly running uh, with short staff that can tend to impact labor a lot and the meals per labor hour, what advice do you have for being able to maintain a positive meals per labor hour with a short staffing situation and still maintain those meals without creating burnout? Like, I, how do you how do you balance yeah, that piece? That, that's a good question. The approach that we're taking here is that as well as assigning uh, menu items, a star or a plow horse or a puzzle, we're also assigning them a level of complexity or how much labor it's going to take in the kitchen. And we're assessing them on a scale of one to five. Um, and hoping that when we plan a menu every day that we're coming up with a three uh, by averaging how much work goes into those menu items. So that's not something that um, uh, we've done with any success before. It's a strategy that we're just rolling out here, but it seems as though that will make sense for us. Oh, that's wonderful. That's really great. And I think that's a big thing is just understanding just how much that labor does does impact. And if you're able to make it a little bit of a simpler product, even if it's not just about the food cost and factoring those meals per labor into that and, food cost is huge. And as, and as we're looking, you know, we're, we're trying to stay away from those those really heavy labor intensive items on, say, a, a Monday and a Friday and concentrating those more towards the middle of the week to take the pressure off uh, and allow you to do a little preliminary work ahead of time and to get ready. Um, and then also, you know, with COVID, um, your um, meals per labor hour uh, tends to dance really um, closely with, with your, your um, food cost. And you'll see that, uh, you know, this district relied extremely heavily on pre-cut portion, cut vegetables, uh, individually wrapped items. And as a result of that, food cost has suffered. So, you know, the labor cost um, was an issue. All we did was shift the burden to food cost in some issues. So we can't wait for COVID to go away so we can do a better job of serving quality food to children and in the cafeteria in a beautiful display 
that we're proud of rather than stuffing it in a styro box and sending it up the hall. Absolutely. That, that appeal, that in-person look of the food, that appetizing piece of it is just so huge. We do have another question. Uh, do you have any thoughts about driving participation in the next year with the, ex with the extension of universal free mm -hmm. meals and how that relates to ME? I don't know if that's me or if that's an acronym, no. Eric. Management of value. Menu engineering, thank you. Menu engineering. Menu engineering. <laughs> so read me the question again. I'm sorry, because okay. I got sidetracked. Do you have any thoughts about driving participation in the next year with the extension of universal free meals and how that relates to menu engineering? Yeah, I mean, again, first of all, we're blessed with the new reimbursement rate. And that reimbursement rate is going to give us some, some comfort going forward. I know in, in our district, we really, really need that um, to recover from sins of years past and, and all the, the devastating effect of COVID. Uh, but it, what it's going to do for you, it's going to give you the opportunity to really maximize that increased uh, reimbursement rate um, to hone in on those items that kids really like um, that um, will um, en enable you to keep more of that reimbursement rate. One of the other things about menu engineering is it gives you the ability to do things, um, uh, to be creative in your menu planning, to tell a story. Um, for instance, um, you know, uh, the district of one of the districts I formerly worked in, we were selling a um, St. Louis cut Memphis style baby back rib on the menu at the high school and in the middle schools. And the food cost on that when we did it, and we did that, you know, six years ago, was a dollar thirty three per unit. And when you looked at the food cost percentage, it was debilitating. You know, nobody in their right mind would put that on the menu because we can't afford to do that in school food. But what we did was every day that we put those ribs on there, we also had pizza, we also had chicken sandwiches, we also had burgers. And when the students came to eat lunch every day, you might have baby back ribs on the menu, but only 12% of the kids were taking baby back ribs. So the marketing um, of that was huge because social media loved it and families loved it and it was a good story to tell. But the fact remained at the end of the day, we were still very profitable because we were so profitable on the menus, that, on the menu items that the kids were actually picking up. So knowing what your cost is and knowing the popularity gives you the ability to play with the menu and make the menu tell a story. That's fantastic. That's really great. And um, one of the other ones that I wanted to ask uh, and invite you to tell the story on is the ability to take menu engineering through throughout the districts and be able to have the districts help one another and um, build on one another's creative, creative ideas. I know that you guys recently held a food truck party. Uh, competition amongst your districts to help kind of boost that morale and that participation. And I would love to hear how that all went. And, and you know, we, we haven't held it there. yet. We haven't held oh, it that's yet. that's right. Okay. I have, throw, I have thrown down the gauntlet and, and challenged um, Greenville and Lexington five here um, and possibly another district in October that we will um, start at one district and can, all four food trucks will get together at the largest high school uh, prepare a menu offering, which is a reimbursable meal. Let the children come out, choose which food truck they choose to get their meal from. Uh, the home district will ch will charge, will claim those meals. Um, therefore, we'll bill the district for the meals so everybody is square, but the participation should go through the roof that day. Um, the next day, we'll roll down the highway. We'll go to the next district's largest uh, high school. We'll spend the day there. We'll do the same menu items for three or four days. And at the conclusion of it all, we'll score it up and see who served more reimbursable meals. And uh, hopefully we'll drive participation in all of those high schools and we'll show kids how cool school food can be. And um, we'll have fun doing it. And then we'll crown a food truck rodeo champion, which I'm sure will be fun. Absolutely. What a great idea. And I just I think that's one of the big things is being able to connect with one another as districts and share those ideas and, and you know, have those friendly competitions and be able to to show that spirit of unity and excitement and all with and, organic tomatoes and, right from your garden, right, Ron? Absolutely, we're gonna capitalize on that. But I think it's exciting that, you know, I, I will be able to, or we will, as we do these menu engineering, get with other food service directors and say, hey, what are your top five? What are your top five? Um, you know, we'll, we'll give you these recipes, you give us those recipes and we can all rise together by capitalizing on the menu engineering that we're doing and, and the knowledge that we have. Absolutely. What a, what a great idea. That's fantastic. And then um, the other question that I had is as we're getting into uh, the new school year with most schools being in session, are there any concerns and with 
so I guess I just should say, because school lines are still an issue. People are still concerned a little bit about the social distancing, but maybe not so much. And I think it's a pretty gray line as to what people are doing. What recommendations do you have to help ensure that lines remain safe with how you're serving your menus and uh, not also create the out the door <laughs> waiting forever situation so that yeah. you um, that perfect balance? We've already made the decision. Um, we are, uh, I personally, um, through my experience with serving kids, I really, really believe in self-service bars and, you know, whether we're doing chicken wing bars or macaroni and cheese bars or, or nacho bars, whatever those, whatever those stations are, are highly, highly popular with kids um, and allow you to be really, really creative. We would love to be rolling those menus here in September, uh, but we know that um, with the, uh, still the concern on, you know, close contact and slowed down lines and hand contact to serving utensils and sneeze guards that people are ov obviously going to be concerned. So we're not going to roll those products out. We're going to wait until January before we start to look at uh, rolling out those interactive food bars. Um, that'll be the biggest, I think, concern as we start to uh, plan those menus. Certainly. Do you guys have ideas to help market in in the absence of those to help market what you guys do have and are available? Do you have some fun ideas for that? Um, no, it goes back to our farm to school. Um, one of the coolest marketing things we're working on right now is when the crops in the field get, um, we're rebranding the organic farms. Um, so we'll have a logo and the logo will inc include a little green leaf for organically grown on our own property. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna take pictures of farmer Phil and farmer Maria over at, at the farm um, and make life side cardboard cutouts of Farmer Phil and Farmer Maria and have them at the entrance to all lines, um, showing the students that that little green insignia means that these products were grown right here organically by us. Um, and that, that um, little green leaf will be on the menus designated anything that's organically grown in dormant here. Um, also, um, signage on the line will show that as well. But we're going to market our farmers. Magnificent. And you know what, what a great opportunity to educate the kids on the beauty of those organic foods and how they're being grown and what, what a great opportunity it is to have that healthy, nutritious food right from their backyard over to their lunches. So that's huge. Wonderful. Well, uh, we have another one. What is the best way for a district to start a farm program in their school? Um, well, small. Um, Not 45 um, acres worth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, we're in a land trust, so and that's a blessing. Um, one thing is in this district is that this farm to school initiative in this district is driven by the superintendent of schools and the school board. And they feel that this is in the best interest of the children of, of uh, Spartanburg School District 6 and failure is not an option. Uh, the expectation is that we're going to do this. So therefore, you know, we have um, five full time workers on the farm. Um, so it's a significant financial um, commitment by the district. And I wouldn't expect that a lot of districts would be ready to jump up and do that right now. We're blessed. So you'd have to start small. Um, and the first thing that I would uh, recommend is looking to granting agencies for small, small school gardens um, in that you integrate those gardens into the cafeteria the best of your ability. Um, you know, I've worked in districts before where we grew sweet potatoes in the gardens. We harvested the sweet potatoes with the kids. They weren't GAP certified. They weren't organically grown. So we brought in sweet potatoes from the vendor. Uh, the day that we harvested the sweet potatoes, we gave them sweet potatoes from the vendor uh, and shared recipes and sent recipes home. So there's ways to connect uh, farm to school without actually needing 48 acres. And so start small and then capitalize wherever you can. That's great. And I, and I imagine though that there's a fair amount, if you're, if you're running your farm well, there's a fair amount of savings where it can create, because it can create a self-sustaining farm, right? Where, where the profits from the foods that you're building then can help yeah. sustain and grow the farm, correct? And we're in a position now where we're, we are, we turning to our neighboring districts and offering organically grown produce to them at regular prices um, because we will get to a point where we can't process all that we have. Um, and so rather than, um, sell it to a vendor to sell at a at a loss. We'll sell it to a local district at what they're paying for a non-organic product. Um, and so we have some local. Our neighbors are getting excited about hoping we make some mistakes and plant too much. <laughs> That's fantastic! What a great opportunity! What a great great way to outreach to the community. Wonderful. Well, great. Well, any other questions that we have from our team here for Ron Jones from South Carolina at Spartanburg Six? Kristen, I'll, I'll look one more point. Um, oh yeah. 
um, every second Saturday morning now in Spartanburg, we'll do a farmer's market, one out at the farm and one at the other side of town. Um, and several of those mornings where we'll be selling our organic produce uh, to the community so we can tell the story, we can share our logo and we let them know this is what's being served to children. We'll also bring the food truck to those farmer's markets where we'll be doing menu tasting uh, for the products as we're doing menu development. And of course, after July, we'll be handling free and reduced applications on the truck as well. Oh my goodness, what a great opportunity. Everybody take notes of where that's gonna be happening. Get yourselves over to South Carolina. <laughs> that's so <laughs> fantastic. Oh, I love hearing all of this. Ron, you've done an awesome, awesome job. Thank you so much for your time today. This has been invaluable and many people are gonna be so excited to, to be able Thank to you. take these tips to their own district. And if so I can be of any help to anybody, please put them in touch with me and I hope I didn't put you to sleep. Oh, you did wonderful. Thank you. And then those Thank of you, you who are here, uh, I just want to invite you and in we've got about a nine minute break. And then if you'll join us in our expo session, we have our manufacturers, um, particularly the Wafflebachers and Pace Schools and um, Impossible Foods who have sponsored us today. And they have some really great items that they are featuring for K through 12 specific that are um, that have child nutrition labels and they're ready for your menus as well. So we would love to have you go in and take a look at their products and see if there's anything that can help to spice up your menus as well, especially with this perfect menu engineering. All right, thank you all so much and we look forward to seeing you at the expo. Thank you everybody, thank you, Kristen.